were back in colonial times, our dooryard garden might be just as pretty as this one, but every plant in it would probably be used for something. For example, people have known for centuries that the leaves on this yarrow plant are styptic, and they would be applied to a cut in order to stop the bleeding. Or this bee balm plant. The leaves of it might be used to make a medicinal tea. I'm Barbara Damrosh. And I'm Elliot Coleman. Stay with us for the next half hour, and we'll introduce you to the tradition of plants that heal. And we'll visit a very creative garden that's filled with healing herbs. On Gardening Naturally. plant is an interesting looking thing, isn't it? Oh, yes. It has these stiff, thick, fleshy leaves that have little spots on them and prickers. And it keeps making more of them, so it almost looks like it's crawling out of the pot. I mean, I keep it around just to look at it, but I know a lot of people who keep these in their kitchens, and when they have minor burns, they'll break off a leaf and use this sticky sap to treat the burn. There's a growing interest today in the healing qualities of plants. I know I'm fascinated. And there's a garden not far from here, the major theme of which is plants that heal. I know the one you mean. It was created by Deb Sewell, who owns Avena Botanicals. I think I'd like to pay Deb a visit. It's a good idea. When you imagine a garden of healing herbs, what do you picture? A collection of plants that's quite different from everything else and a little strange? Well, you might be in for a surprise. I'm here at Deb Sewell's garden now. And it's a garden of earthly delights. It's very beautiful. It's full of flowers. And a lot of them are flowers that you just might find in your own garden already. It's also luring plenty of the local wildlife. There's bees and butterflies everywhere. Now, come on. Deb is going to give me a tour. Hi, Deb. Hi, Barbara. Everything's in full bloom today. Yeah, it's a nice time of year here. Tell me something about Avena Botanicals. What's it all about? Well, I call it an herbal apothecary. An herbal apothecary. Well, what's that? It's a, a traditional pharmacy, only full of herbs. Mm -hmm. Well, now, show me some of these herbs and how they grow and what they're used for. Okay. I'd love to take you for a walk. Great. Deb, here's a big, healthy bed of something or other. This is sacred basil. Sacred? Why is it sacred? It's considered to be a sacred plant to um, people of the Hindu tradition living in India, mm. those who worship the god Vishnu, and they grow it outside of their houses, and uh, during the, their morning prayers, or early morning prayers, they will eat a few of the leaves. Mm. It's a wonderful, spicy, uh, very nice aromatic yeah. uh, smell to it. As you can see, the bees adore this plant, and when it begins to flower here is when we come along and we'll pick some of the flowers and uh, put it, it makes a nice tasting tea in the summertime, also one which we will dry for the winter time, and very nice tea for supporting the immune system. Great. Now here's another old favorite that grows in my garden, purple yeah. coneflower. Yeah, this is one of my favorite mm. herbs. It's such a sweet Gosh. smell to it. Echinacea. Yeah. There's uh, about nine different species that grow in this country. The medicinal uses of this plant come to us from the Native American people who mm. traditionally used this plant for supporting the immune system, colds and flus, fevers, snake bites, sore throats, things like that. Both the leaves and the flowers and the root, once the plant has become three years old, can be used. So they had a, a whole drugstore in one plant, yes, it sounds did. like. Yes. Deb, here's another little plant that pops up all over my garden, Johnny Jump Up. This, it's such a sweet little plant with so many different colored flowers. Mm -hmm. and the Europeans call this plant Heart's Ease Pansy. Heart's Ease. No, uh, used as a tea for melancholy. Oh. <laughs> There's a plant that I have in my garden, but I use it as a cooking herb, rosemary. I put it in roasted potatoes and, oh, all sorts of things. Wow, this lovely plant is, is uh, one of my favorite herbs. I have 13 of these large rosemaries, wow. ranging from 15 years actually to up to 30 years. And it makes a lovely tea for headaches mm -hmm. and circulation problems. You have uh, cold tea for that. Also, um, nice 
tea to help relax the nervous system. Uh -huh. Also a tea rinse for hair and stimulating hair growth, both for people and animals. That's interesting. I like to grow mullein just because of its gray, soft, healthy foliage and those magnificent flower spikes. It's very pretty how this plant is surrounded by a contrasting one with dark, purpley leaves. What plant is this, Dan? Well, it's commonly called toothache plant, and the Latin name is Spilanthes acmella. And go ahead and try chewing a leaf. See what you think. My tongue just went to sleep. <laughs> it has a very strong numbing effect mm. on the mouth. That's why it's called toothache plant. So you'd use it to numb yeah. a painful part of the yeah. mouth. That's yeah. pretty interesting. Yeah, it is. Now over here you have one of my favorite flowers, calendula. It's one that I love very much because of it's such a brilliant, bright, happy color in the garden. Yeah. And it just keeps flowering for about two and a half, three months continuously. Even after frost. Well, even after frost. And for us, we just keep picking the flowers. And we'll pick this whole bed. In about two days, it'll look just like this. And I, oh. I prefer to pick the flowers when they just begin to open like this. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll put them fresh in tea because of their color. And also lay them out on screens to dry. And then I also um, will mix them with olive oil once they're dry. And make an oil or make a salve out of them to apply topically for cuts and burns and itchy skin, things oh, really? like that. Yeah. Deb, I love the way you planted some borage with its bright blue flowers right in the middle of your calendulas. That's a great color scheme. Actually, the borage decided to plant itself there. As any gardener who plants borage in their garden, it just will reseed itself all over the garden. Now, that's an old-fashioned plant I remember from New England housewife herbals. Borage for courage. Yeah, it's a great borage for courage. And the flowers, actually, these beautiful little star-shaped flowers are such a wonderful addition to a fresh tea to float on your tea mm. or to add into a salad because they're edible along with some of your bright orange calendula blossoms and also to put into ice cubes to freeze for to put to float in your punch things like that oh, that's a lovely it's idea a nice addition and the leaves too make a nice tea either fresh or dried to add into a tea for mothers nursing mothers to help promote good healthy milk great yeah now what's this wonderful bushy thing here now, this is lemon balm, and oh, it has yes. the most wonderful lemon fragrance, and its Latin name, Melissa officinalis. Official Melissa. Yes. It's a lot of the, your plants that have the officinalis species are the official species that were in the old pharmacopoeias. Well, explain what pharmacopoeia is. Um, well, in many of the centuries gone by, uh, including up to the present time, you'll see listings of medicinal plants that were used at that time by pharmacists. Mm -hmm. and so they were the books that they would refer to for recipes and for information. Mm -hmm. And of course, the bees just adore this plant that the word Melissa is the Greek word for bee. Oh, I see. And so anyone who wants bees is another bee plant, along with, I have bee bombs in another part of the garden. Oh, show me your yeah. bee balm. I love that one. Oh, this is a great arbor, Deb. What do you have growing on it? It's hops growing. Oh, like you make beer from. Yeah. What, what do you make the beer from? What part of the plant? These little uh, strobles are what they're called. They look like flowers, but botanically speaking, they're actually called strobles. Strobles. And as they get plump and fill out about mid-August, we'll come and gather them, and they make a wonderful tea for helping one go to sleep. Uh -huh. And the bee balm is over here. Oh, it's... You have several colors. Yeah. Isn't that nice? I love all the different colors, and they bloom at different times. And of course, they're just covered with bees. Yeah, they're going bananas. And especially in the morning, I'll come out here and sit, and the hummingbirds will visit uh, these bee bombs. So anybody trying to bring hummingbirds to their garden, the bee bomb will help. That'll do it. And when they're flowering, it's also one that I will come along and gather and add into a tea uh, because it's beautiful color. And you can also dry the whole flowers and leaves makes a nice tea in the wintertime to give some strength to the mm. immune system. Uh, tell me about these big leaf plants here, Deb. Well, this is comfrey, mm -hmm. a very, very tough perennial to ever get rid of. Once you plant a little root in the spot that you plant it, it will always come back there. Yeah. So you have to be sure you want it to be there. The leaves are what we will gather and lay them out to dry onto screens or hang them in bunches. Makes a wonderful addition into an oil or, or into a salve for helping heal cuts and things like that. It's also one to make as a poultice, meaning we'll take the leaves and chop them up fresh and put them between some gauze and apply them to an mm -hmm. area that's 
a little bit swollen or inflamed to help bring down the swelling. Now, you're going to teach me how to make a sap. Yeah. I really want to learn. I, we can go in the garden house and I can show you how to do that. Great. So, Barbara, I, I set up a little demonstration to show you how to make sap because it's so much fun and so easy to make and a really wonderful thing for anyone to know how to make a sap. And the calendulas that we pick make a wonderful salve wow. to use for cuts and burns and chap lips and sunburns and little rashes that itch, mm -hmm. bug bites, things like that. Really nice little remedy for that. Well, how do we do it? So, well, we take the fresh calendula flowers and we'll take a jar and just, we can both together just fill this jar full of the fresh flowers. We'll just kind of lightly stuff them right in the jar. Fill them right up. Enough to the top. I'll just put a couple more in there so okay. it's kind of filled up there. And then we'll take um, olive oil. And the reason I use olive oil is the oil that has the longest shelf life. Mm -hmm. So we'll just... I like the smell of it, too. Yeah, olive oil has a nice <coughs> smell to it. So we'll just carefully fill this jar full of olive oil. So you're filling it right up to the top? We'll fill it right to the top. And once it's completely filled up, but what I prefer to do is not to cover it with uh, a metal cover, but either paper towel or cheesecloth, something that's breathable, mm. so that you don't have mold growing in your jar. And I just keep it in a warm place for 10 to 14 days. Mm -hmm. And at that point, after 10 to 14 days, what I'll do is take a, some cheesecloth and I'll just strain off the oil and separate the plant matter from the oil and just be left with an herb oil with a lovely amber color yeah. Yeah. and then what we do from that is to make a, all it is is to make a salve is that you add beeswax and that's what makes you have a solid oil oh i see for, so it's not spilling all, yeah, all over the place right. right so what um we have about 16 ounces of herb oil here and to make a salve a simple guideline is to use one part of beeswax to four parts of oil. So since we have 16 ounces of herb oil, we're going to weigh out four ounces of beeswax. Okay. Well, we got just an ordinary kitchen scale here. It looks like that should do it. Where do you get beeswax, Deb? Well, I get it from a local beekeeper here, mm. and it's anybody can just ask around in their community and find out who's keeping bees and who's making beeswax. Or you could go to a health food store and ask mm -hmm. them to get beeswax for you. Okay. So then the next step in making salve is you, you um, bring your beeswax, once you've measured it out, over and place it into a glass pot or an enamel pot. Mm -hmm. And beeswax becomes liquid at 140 degrees. So the next step, once your beeswax is in your pot, is to then completely pour all of your herb oil into the pot and slowly warm your beeswax and oil until it becomes liquid. Hmm. There, that looks about ready. It's become liquid. So now what do we do? What we'll do is we'll take this measuring cup and put it right into the liquid. And from there, we'll fill this little gravy pour. Okay, how come you don't just dip the red dipper in to begin with? What I like to do is keep a measuring cup right in the herb oil since it's so warm and it will keep this from becoming too um, filled with beeswax because as soon as right. this begins to touch this, the beeswax will solidify. So this will enable to keep everything melted. And then we'll come over to the sap tins and just carefully mm -hmm. begin to pour the liquid into the sap tins. And as the oil begins to cool, the beeswax will solidify and we'll be left with a solid sap. Where do you get these little tins, Deb? You get them from different uh, kind of bottle companies or packing, packaging house supply companies or catalogs. Even the drugstore sometimes will sell you little containers. And you can use a variety of things, little glass containers or little wooden containers. Well, yeah, you could put it in something decorative and it would make yeah. a nice little present. Yeah. How long does it take before it solidifies? It usually takes four to five minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and then it will be solidified. It's as simple as it. Wow, you can really see them changing color. Yeah. The beeswax has lightened up the oil, mm -hmm. and now they're solidified and they're ready to use. Oh, let's try, try it. it. Okay, well, 
looks for a little sunburn from all that sun. And so is my nose. And I got a little mosquito bite here. You can smell it. It has a nice... Oh, that's, that's really nice. Nice, nice natural, natural smell. Okay, yeah. can I keep this one? Yeah, go ahead. Great. Thank yeah. you, Deb. Here you go. Now, I hate to waste all those beautiful calendula blossoms. Is there something we can do with the rest yeah. of them? What we'll do is take them upstairs and put them in the drying racks and let them dry for a tea. Oh, show me how you do that. What a great setup. Yeah, and drying calendula is, is a very simple process. All we'll do here is just... Bring the basket over and um, okay, just dump it out. Dump, go ahead and dump it out, and we'll just basically together we can just kind of scatter these flowers so they're kind of evenly distributed on the screen, and they take about a week and a half to dry here. Okay. Now I see you've got some that have. Obviously, been on there longer. And this is these have been here on a couple for a couple days. You can see they're beginning to open. Yeah, they shrink well, well and they're yeah. a little drier. Yeah. And the ones here have been drying for about four or five days, and they're pretty close to getting dry. You just I, every day I'll come and check the herbs to see how dry they are, and when they feel dry enough, I'll put them in a paper bag. Now you have these on some kind of window screen. Yeah, this is just a nylon screen that you can get from any hardware store and. Just a staple to the thing. Staple right on. Yeah. Now, what kind of a room do you need for this? I know this is not dark in here. Well, ideally, a warm room like the, you know, this is the second floor of a building or right. an attic. Um, Some place where it's warm, like 85 degrees is an ideal temperature for drying herbs. Mm -hmm. You want to have some kind of air circulation, so there's, we have windows here to help with circulation. You don't want to have the sun directly on your herbs. Mm -hmm. It's okay if it's not dark, just as long as the sun's not shining directly. Now, on what, are you, what are you drawing here? Mm -hmm. This is a catnip, oh, yeah. which I pick when the flowers are full. And it also has some comfrey. So we're looking at big big leaves. Yep. It's gotten small already. Drying comfrey mm -hmm. also. Hey. Wow. They just dry themselves, don't they? Yeah, they yeah. do. A little yeah. bit of heat and warmth. The other thing people can do too sometimes is to bunch herbs. And hang them upside down. Use a rubber band around them so that uh -huh. they, they'll stay tight. And then hang them up from a beam or a rope or something like that. And that's right. another simple way. But drying is it's a pretty simple process. Thank you for your hospitality and all of your helpful advice. And for showing me your garden, which is beautiful. Well, it's been really fun to show another gardener who appreciates such beauty the gardens. And thank you, too, for a delightful day. Thanks, Deb. <laughs> We've both grown up really traditionally, especially where health is concerned and how you treat illness. With this new interest in old ways of healing, using medicinal plants, I mean, what do you think about it? Do you think there's really a lot to it? All the, these concepts definitely have some basis to them, even if it's only in my mind. Well, I think there's a lot we have to learn. I mean, I'm kind of fascinated by it. There's so much that they're still discovering about plants. Some plants that haven't even been found yet that we don't know exist may hold cures to all kinds of, of things. People use it as an argument to preserve plants. Well, we can't let such and such go extinct because it might cure cancer. I mean, I happen to think that all of these plants should be preserved just for their own merit, just because they're there. Yes, but the idea that plants in rainforests or parts of the world that we are interested in preserving can contain principles that will be useful to human beings is an extra incentive yes. to get some energy going to help preserve those areas and the plants with them. Uh, plants are an amazing resource. We should definitely uh, uh, consider them as a pharmacopoeia to begin with. If I think about how I first got interested in gardens, it probably stems back to reading the Peter Rabbit books by Beatrice Potter as a child. I loved the idea of Mr. McGregor's garden, although I probably identified more with Peter. But because of that, I've always loved the chamomile tea that Peter's mother made for him when he came home that night. Chamomile tea is made from the blossoms of the chamomile plant. This is German chamomile, the annual, as opposed to Roman chamomile, the perennial, and I think this makes the better tea. Now, some people will pick them by sliding their fingers in through the blossoms as if they were a cranberry rake and then pulling upward. But the problem with that is that you'll sometimes get stems on there, and the stem doesn't make as good tea. 
My preferred technique is just to slide my fingers up the stem and snap my thumbnail right against it as I get the blossom over my basket. And I can pick a whole lot of it this way. Snap. Snap. When the basket's full, I take this inside and I set it in a warm, dry place in the kitchen. So all these blossoms will dry down to a good tea consistency. When the blossoms are dry, they look like this. And from that point on, I treat them like I would any other tea. I'll take a teaspoon of them and put it into the pot per cup of tea I wish to make. After I add the boiling water and let it steep for a bit, I'll pour it through a little strainer, and I have a cup of delicious chamomile tea. Now, many people think that this tea is settling or calming. All I know is that I like to drink it. In our garden, we grow flowers for beauty and also for the wildlife, and we grow vegetables to feed the body. But it's fascinating to think that in the old days, almost all of people's needs were met by plants. But you know, a lot of those traditional uses are being rediscovered. And also, all over the world, new plants are being found with important properties. It's fun to imagine the garden of the future. There's always something to look forward to in gardening, isn't there? And on that note, goodbye and good gardening. Next on TLC, doing something for your home can be easy, even fun. Check and see here on Home Bodies. Then, add value to your home with some serious improvements. The Home Pro shows you how.